Each week, American Artifacts takes viewers into archives, museums, and historic sites around the country. Next, from our visit to the National Cryptologic Museum, a look at one of their exhibits about the making and breaking of secret codes and their role in U.S. history. We're going to talk about the Battle of Midway. And really, despite the fact that it happened way back in 1942, there's no better example of showing how cryptology applied correctly uh, in time of war can be what the military refers to as a force multiplier, something that can help you even the odds when you are at a great disadvantage. Now, our story starts in the spring of 1942, and uh, let's just say that the United States Navy was not uh, in a good position. We were down to about 50 ships. We had three aircraft carriers, about 47 other assorted craft. The Japanese Navy, on the other hand, at the time had over 200 ships and six to eight aircraft carriers that they could deploy. More importantly, the Japanese Navy, uh, after Pearl Harbor, conquered over a seventh of the Earth's surface in a few months' time. Uh, it was an amazing military uh, operation, and we very much uh, underestimated the Japanese. Now, Admiral Yamamoto, who was in charge of the naval effort, was moving at a rapid clip uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, we didn't have the manpower and the resources out in the Pacific quite yet to deal with the, the Japanese uh, operation. But the other reason he's moving quickly is he wants to end the war in a short period of time. Why? Well, he figured correctly that it would take about a year for American factories to convert from peacetime to wartime production. And once that 12-month limit had been reached, the factories would begin to churn out so many guns and planes and tanks that Japan would eventually be overwhelmed. So he's seeking to end the war as quickly as he can. The American Navy is like a boxer on the ropes. One more punch and he'll be down for the count. And he wants to throw that punch now rather than later. He left the home islands of Japan in the spring of 1942 with the largest fleet uh, in the history of naval warfare up to that point in time. He's going to attack an American-held island. Uh, the uh, 50 ships will come out to defend it. He will destroy them with his overwhelming numbers. And when they're gone, he is hoping and praying that Franklin Roosevelt will throw in the towel and sign a peace treaty with Japan that will leave them in control of vast regions of the Pacific. Now, Las Vegas hadn't been created yet. It was a bus stop out in the desert. But if there had been odds makers in Vegas at the time, they would have given all of the advantages to the Japanese. They were like a football team that was 16-0 and barely scored upon. But amazingly, the Japanese do not win the Battle of Midway, and partially that's because we had great leadership ourselves. This is a photo of Admiral Chester Nimitz, uh, a man who was able to restore morale quite quickly after Pearl Harbor. But Nimitz is not on, only laboring under a handicap of a lack of resources and manpower, but he also has another challenge, and that is this. We have not yet broken Japan's naval codes. Now, after Pearl Harbor, we got smart. and We began to apply more manpower and resources to breaking the military codes. And there were any number of organizations that were devoted to doing just that. Station Hypo out at Pearl Harbor, under the leadership of Commander Joseph Roach for the United States Navy, is working assiduously every day to break Japanese naval systems. There's another organization back in Washington called Op20G that is doing the very same thing. After a lot of very, very tough work in uh, uh, May of 1942, they achieve a breakthrough and they begin to read portions of Japanese naval messages to the point where they can pretty much ascertain what the Japanese are going to do. When they look at the messages, they are able to see clearly that the next objective for Japan is AF. The next question, of course, is what does AF correspond to? Rochford came to the conclusion fairly quickly, because he'd been doing this type of analysis for quite a while, that AF was definitely Midway Island. Most importantly, he convinced Nimitz that this was the case, and Nimitz informed the Marines on Midway to be ready for a massive Japanese invasion. So far, the plan seems to be going quite well. The problem was this. The uh, superiors of these gentlemen in Washington, Admiral King and Admiral Redmond, were not quite sure that they were on the right track. Nimitz was never ordered to uh, put this plan on the shelf, but they did question him and basically second guess him, not so much because they weren't confident in his leadership abilities, but because they were worried. And you can understand why they were worried. We were down to 50 ships. 
If Nimitz was wrong, that would mean that both Hawaii and the West Coast could be open to Japanese invasion. Uh, the second guessing, though, really uh, got under Rochefort's skin. And he wanted to put an end to it, so he proposed a very simple way to do that. He respectfully asked Admiral Nimitz to help him with a plan to prove that they were right. He respectfully requested Nimitz to order the Marines on Midway to go to their radio center and send out what will be a false message, a message that will say that the water plant on the island that draws in seawater and t turns it into fresh drinking water is broken and that there's no fresh drinking water on the island. Now that message is sent out despite the fact that it's demonstrably false. There's plenty of drinking water, but they want the Japanese to think there's a problem. Well, they prayed that the Japanese would intercept it. Guess what? They do. How do we know? Days later, there is a message sent from Guam, a Japanese naval center at Guam. It is intercepted by the Americans. We can read those messages now. When we break the message, it is the minutes of an intelligence meeting that was held in Tokyo a few days prior. And guess what one of the topics of conversation was? AF is short of water. Now Nimitz has proved his point, and he can put his ships uh, exactly where he wants them, and ultimately he is able to stage a brilliant, brilliant nautical ambush. Now the early parts of this battle were a challenge, despite the fact that we knew the direction the Japanese were approaching from. The Pacific Ocean is a big place. We had lots of different elements uh, trying to locate the Japanese fleet. We had a little bit of trouble doing it, and uh, we uh, lost a lot of very brave pilots in the beginnings of this battle. However, when you know what your adversary is going to do, when you have their battle plan, and they can only guess what you're doing, sooner or later, if you keep pressing, you will gain an advantage. And at quarter after 10 on June 4th, a collection of dive bombers from the Enterprise in Yorktown found three of Japan's top-of-the-line carriers in close proximity. They attacked, and in 25 minutes, this was the result. Now, American naval forces were able to destroy a fourth carrier later that afternoon. It is worth noting that all four of those carriers had been part of the raid on Pearl Harbor, and they were now gone forever. Most importantly, it will now be the United States on the attack, on the offense, and after several more years of bloody fighting, uh, Japan will surrender in the fall of 1945. Midway was definitely the turning point. Now, please don't go back to the wonderful organization you work for, C-SPAN, and tell everybody that uh, we won the Battle of Midway because of cryptology. Cryptologists don't win battles. If they did, Poland would have won World War II in the first week. Cryptologists help, but you've got to have soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines who are willing to stand in harm's way and carry the fight to the enemy. You also have to have guns and planes and tanks and implements of war. But even with all that, cryptology can be a huge help because it can help you to know what the enemy is going to do before they do it. Now, if you know that, the odds of victory are going to go up. Something else will happen as well. We lost around 300 people at the Battle of Midway, and that's a tragedy, but the Japanese lost over 2,500 people. So cryptology done right not only helps you to win, but it also helps you to save lives. And if you ever have to uh, describe to somebody what this game is all about, why it's important to break the codes of the enemy and protect your own, this still, despite the fact that it happened in 1942, is one of the very best examples you could use. You can watch this and other American Artifacts programs at any time by visiting our website, cspan.org history.